I would like to welcome everyone to the Civica Data Science Seminar Series um, hosted today by the LSE's Data Science Institute. It's my pleasure today to introduce Laura Klein. She is a, the Winship Distinguished Research Professor and an Associate Professor in the Departments of English and Quantitative Theory and Methods at, Uni at Emory University. She also directs the Digital Humanities Lab. Lauren edits the Debates in Digital Humanities, which is a hybrid print digital publication stream that explores debates in the field as they emerge. She's also the author of An Archive of Taste, Race, and Eating in the Early United States. Lauren has co-authored Data Feminism with Catherine D'Ignazio, and will draw on this today to present a set of principles for doing data science that are informed by the past several decades of intersectional feminist activism and critical thought. Lauren is going to share with us how feminist thinking is being incorporated into data-driven work and how scholars in the humanities and social sciences are bringing together data science and feminist theory in their research. I'll now turn it over to you, Laura, and to our audience to put questions into the chat. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you for everyone to being here today in what is approaching full year two of the pandemic. Um, I am going to share my screen. Okay, excellent. Um, oops, let's do that. And uh, Ken, how does this look? Does this uh, seem okay? Looks great. Excellent, okay. Um, so what I'm going to do today is speak for hopefully on the shorter side of things, uh, 30, 35, 40 minutes, um, and then I'll be very eager to hear your questions on the topic of what feminist data science looks like. Um, and as was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, this work comes out of a collaborative project, a book called Data Feminism that I co-authored with Catherine D'Ignazio, um, who's an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT. And she is on research leave this year, uh, otherwise she would have been here as well. So just to jump right in, the motivating premise of our book is that in the world today, data is a tremendous form of power. So you could think of how data-driven systems have been used for first round resume screen, uh, screening at major corporations, including Amazon, where they were found to discriminate against women applicants. Um, in the United States and Pennsylvania, um, they've been used to flag parents who are suspected of child abuse, uh, very often unfairly and with understandably devastating consequences on the families who are uh, erroneously marked as suspicious. Um, you could think of in the UK, the recent fiasco around last year's A-level exam scores um, when the exams were canceled due to the pandemic. I mean, I, I could go on, you know, I could keep, I could probably fill an entire talk with just example upon example upon example of failed systems like this. But the main point is this, that data are indeed incredibly powerful, but that power is currently wielded unequally. And more specifically, it's wielded by a small and homogenous group of corporations and other well-resourced institutions. So these are the people who, and the corporations who have the resources to design and deploy these data systems for their own profit at the expense of everyone else. So this is where feminism enters in. And what we do in the book is explain how feminism and intersectional feminism in particular has been focused on precisely this thing, on imbalances of power and the structural forces of, that cause them for a very long time. So I just want to back up a minute. So you are maybe listening to this and thinking, you know, wait, I thought feminism was about women or maybe about gender. Um, but here you're saying it's about power. Um, you know, how is it that you've gotten from point A to point B? And so I want to take a couple of minutes to explain. So you're probably right in your assumption that feminism at its core entails a belief in equality for all genders. But if you take a look around you, you realize that this goal of equality has not yet been realized in the world. 
And so feminism also necessarily involves organized activity on behalf of women and non-binary people to make this goal of equality the reality. And then feminism also has a third definition, which is a set of theories and ideas. So these theories began by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But the past 40 years of scholarship, and honestly just sort of the political reality, have brought many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation. So these include race, class, sexuality, ability, and more. So this brings me back around to this idea of intersectional feminism. Now, many of you, again, you know, I, I know that everyone is coming from a very wide range of backgrounds and expertise. So some of you may already be familiar with the idea of intersectional feminism. This comes to us from the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular. And what feminists gain from concepts like the Kampahi Rivers formulation of, quote, interlocking systems of oppression, um, Kimberly Crenshaw's term intersectionality, Patricia Hill Collins's idea of the matrix of domination. Um, these are all frameworks that structure critiques of power. In other words, the reason why certain people, including women, might experience oppression on the one hand or privilege on the other. Now, the intersection and intersectionality comes from the view that it's not possible to isolate certain forces of privilege or oppression from others. So while we might be interested in the effects of sexism, for example, we must recognize that other forces, such as racism, classism, colonialism, and so on, they interlock and intersect with each other in ways that are impossible to separate. And crucially, also in ways that compound their effects. And so just one more thing to emphasize here, and this may already be evident, but I want to make it explicit, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity. So it doesn't just mean, you know, I, Lauren Klein, I'm a white cisgender woman, I live in the global north, I live in the US south. You know, it doesn't just mean sort of these, these aspects of my identity. What intersectionality is describing are the structural forces of power and their intersection that produce the effects that I experience as a result of my those aspects of my identity. And it's really been the work of intersectional feminism that has foregrounded the conversation about forces of power, about the root cause. And so the basic argument that we make in the book is that intersectional feminism, when applied to this unequal balance of power in data science, as also exists more broadly in the world, can help that power be challenged, it can help it be rebalanced, and ultimately help it be changed. So what we do in the book is use the teachings of intersectional feminism, actually I should say along with other ideas from feminist activism and critical thought more broadly, in order to arrive at these seven principles for doing ethical and equitable data science. So you can see them, they are examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies, elevate emotion and embodiment, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. Um, and in the book, we have actually one chapter devoted to each principle where we talk a little bit about the feminist theory that underlies that particular principle, and then illustrate how it can be applied to data science work through just a lot of examples. Oh, and one thing that I, I should say about the book too, it's available, it exists as a physical book. Usually I have it sitting next to me, but I don't at this moment. Um, but it also exists open access online. Um, through the MIT Press website. So if you Google data feminism open access, you'll be able to find a copy of the book and all of these chapters there. Um, so I'll just say more broadly, you know, our goal with these principles was to really operationalize feminism for data science. So to provide a clear set of principles for people currently working with data, um, for people who want to work with data, or for people who want to refuse to work with data on ideological grounds. Um, and while I don't have time in the talk today to discuss each of these principles, what I'm going to do in the next portion of the talk, which is the rest of the talk, um, is pull out a couple of examples, both from the book that are very central to illustrating what we mean 
by these particular principles, as well as tell you a little bit about the projects that Catherine and I have undertaken since completing the book that reflect our own attempts to enact the principles that we spoke on behalf of that we advocated for um, in our own book. And I'd be happy to talk outside of the formal remarks about what we've gained um, from returning and reassessing our own uh, research practices, as well as what the challenges have been. So I'll turn here uh, to this project. This is called The Library of Missing Datasets. It's by Mimi Onuoha. Um, she's an artist and educator. And uh, this project is one that we discuss very, very early on in the book because it is centrally concerned with this principle of examining power. So this project is displayed in two ways. Uh, first, as a GitHub repository. That's what you see in the screenshot on the right. You can also Google it and find it and look at it right now. Um, what it does is list these missing data sets. Um, so if you can read this, uh, you can see titles like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime or uh, people excluded from public housing because of criminal records. Um, this artwork, it was created pre-COVID, but I think the ways that COVID has had such disparate impacts across social groups um, and around the world has really awakened all of us and really helped to animate these concerns about missing data. Um, in any case, the second way to encounter this uh, artwork is actually as a physical installation. So that's the file cabinet that you see in the photograph on the left. The idea is that you walk into the gallery um, now in a mask, uh, you see this file cabinet with folders, you tab through them, you read the names of the data sets on the tabs, you might go to open one of the folders that you think seems interesting or important or worthy of note. But when you do, you discover that the folder is empty, the data sets in this case are physically missing. And the point that Onuoha is trying to make in this piece with these empty file folders and the like is that these data sets are missing for a reason. And that reason, if I had to gloss it, would be the profound imbalance of power with respect to data collection in the world today. So this is the imbalance of power that determines what data are collected and what are not, um, or what research is conducted and what research is not. Again, governments have this power, moneyed institutions have this power, and minoritized groups generally do not. And so this is why a feminist approach to data and to data science begins with an analysis of power, because far too often the data sets that we can access, and then in turn the questions that they prompt, have already been overdetermined by this imbalance of power in the world. So the next example has to do with feminicide. Um, this is a case of missing data, um, and it occurs pretty much everywhere in the world. The example that I'm going to talk about here has to do with feminicide in Mexico. Um, and in the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero. Um, this is a woman who resolved to head straight towards this problem of missing data and collect it herself. So just to back up, um, feminicide, these, uh, this describes gender-related killings of women and girls. This includes both cis and trans women. And feminicide is legally defined as a crime in uh, a handful of countries, including Mexico, but the state does not systematically collect data on feminicides. Um, they're also the subject of emerging public anger in Latin America. And if you're interested just in what the scope of this uh, conversation looks like, you can look at the hashtag on Twitter, ni una menos. Um, and this has to do with the way in which the state neglects to fully implement its own laws and provisions. So frustrated by this lack of action, Salguero has single-handedly compiled the largest archive of feminicides in Mexico. Um, she does this by spending two to four hours, a day, uh, hours per day logging feminicides on this Google map that you see. Um, she calls uh, reports from uh, media accounts and her work has been used to help families locate loved ones, provide data to journalists and NGOs. And ironically, she has been called in to testify in front of Mexico's Congress multiple times. So this is a form of what might be called feminist counter data. So this is activist data collection that steps in 
when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. And it represents one way to use data to challenge power. Now, I, I'm actually going to continue talking a little bit about feminicide, but I want to just voice a very important caveat, which is that collecting more data about a particular issue is not a universal solution. Sometimes drawing attention or increased exposure to a community, particularly a vulnerable community, can in fact bring that population significant harm. And so I don't want you to take away from this particular slide and point that the solution to all missing data sets is just to fill in the gaps. Um, always, always, always context is queen, as we say in the book. But I will talk um, a little bit more about the topic of feminicide in particular, because this has to do with some of Catherine's work that she's undertaken since we published Data Feminism. So one of the things that we did in writing the book is we interviewed many of the people whose projects we feature in the book. And I should actually give all credit to Catherine. She came from a journalism department. She used to uh, be sort of the data journalism person before she moved to MIT. And so her instinct also was to talk to the people. And as a, someone who tends to deal with historical issues, you know, the people I deal with are always long gone. So this is not, not something that was top of mind for me. But we did end up speaking to many, many of these project creators. Um, and one of the things that Catherine discovered um, in interviewing Maria Salguero was that Maria was far from the only person or even civil society group who was collecting and publishing data about feminicide. And since then, Catherine has actually undertaken interviews with many of these groups as part of a participatory action, uh, as part of participatory action research. And she now has over 150 projects on an internal list that she is keeping in collaboration with many of these groups across many countries. So the majority of these groups are located in Latin America, um, where feminist movements have done so much of the work to put feminicide on the global public agenda. Um, but there are also uh, efforts from many other locations, including uh, in my home country, the United States. Um, some groups monitor specific types of feminicide as it intersects with racism, with colonialism, um, with cis sexism, um, like the Sovereign Bodies Institute, which monitors missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. Um, there's Data Labe in Brazil, which monitors transgender violence. Um, and as with Maria Salguero's project, these groups are using counter data collection to challenge power. So for them, this involves compiling spreadsheets and publishing analyses, including maps and stories, as a way to shift public policy and draw attention to the disproportionate violence faced by women and indigenous people or queer and trans people simply for being who they are. So. And as an extension of this project, uh, Catherine has joined forces with two collaborators um, and initiated a project called Data Against Feminicide. And there are three goals of this project. First, um, one goal is to understand why and how activists are collecting counter data about fem feminicide and related gender based violence. Um, a second goal is to use that information to work with activists directly to co-design digital tools that support and sustain their work. Um, and the third goal, because so many of the people that Catherine has interviewed and connected with, um, they really saw the need for it, it's to build a growing um, and global community of practice for people who are working on feminicide and data around the world. So one of the main principles of this project that comes from data feminism that Catherine is working really hard to integrate is this idea of embracing pluralism. So I just wanna take a little bit of time to talk about what that means. Um, so to date, there's actually been a very little work done on what participatory processes for data science look like. Um, and this actually stands in stark contrast to fields that I was view as really adjacent to data science work um, that have longstanding experimentation with public and participatory processes, as well as ideas about co-design. So you could think of the field of design, of urban planning, of HCI, um, all of these fields have a rich, long and robust literature as well as practice about what this type of work looks like. Um, 
But a feminist approach here would involve following the work of Donna Haraway. Um, this means a commitment to feminist knowledge production, uh, rather, um, what this would mean or what this would uh, entail is a belief that our knowledge becomes more robust when we pool our perspectives. So when we bring uh, more people to the design and analysis table. But this in turn raises a second question, which is when we are embracing pluralism in the process of doing data science, we practically can't bring everyone's voice to the table, right? Um, you need to make choices about whose voices to prioritize. Now, one approach to this would be to sort of wring your hands and spend a lot of time anguishing over how to make decisions about who is involved. But feminist theory actually has a very clear answer to this that can short circuit or shortcut um, a lot of these discussions. So following the work of Sandra Harding, of Patricia Hill Collins, and Shawin Bardzell, a feminist design perspective would take power into account and center the experiences of people at the edges and the margins first and foremost. So making decisions and design decisions from the outside in. So this is the perspective that Catherine is taking in the Data Against Feminicide project. Um, she's convening activists and civil society groups who are already collecting data about feminicide um, in their specific contexts, often in specific intersectional contexts. Um, and she's trying to understand their information practices and how integrating new or adapted digital tools might support and sustain their significant labor. And one of the really interesting things um, to note about this project, and this I feel like this is really Catherine's anecdote to share and not mine, but it really stuck with me when I've heard Catherine speak on her work, has to do with the role of these digital tools. You know, the assumption is always that tools that increase efficiency, that expand scope, that enable broader data collection and then action upon the data that are collected, these are always desirable. Um, even when dealing with or when entering into one of these co-design pro uh, projects. You know, this is one of these, I would say, one of the sort of implicit beliefs of data science that being able to do things at scale more rapidly and more accurately, this is always sort of the, the desirable good. Except in talking to some of these activist groups, one of the things that Catherine learned was that many of the activists really like or not like, but feel that it is important to spend time with the data and the collection process because they viewed the time that they spent reading through these reports, hand at tabulating and adding the records of individual lives into, for example, a spreadsheet help to sort of honor and sit with the loss of that person and in some ways pay respects to it. And so when Catherine said, you know, do you want us to automate this? And one of the projects that she's been working on are a couple of different classifiers that can automatically identify certain news articles as containing a report of a feminicide or not. Um, some of the activist groups said, no, we want to be doing this work. This is a form of labor that is commemorative, um, that entails an aspect of honoring these victims um, in their lives, as even as it takes us significant time, attention, even sort of emotional cost on us. So um, that's, like I said, before, this is really Catherine's project to talk about, but I did want to bring that up because I thought it was a really valuable um, lesson for all of us who sort of immediately think the goal should always be speed, size, scale. So at this point, I want to sort of transition a little bit uh, to this question of labor um, and forms of labor and the different types of labor that may be easily or in certain cases not so easily captured by data. And I want to talk a little bit in particular about the idea of invisible labor, which, as it turns out, is a feminist concept. Um, so there's this whole field of feminist labor studies, which draws from the original example of invisible labor, which is housework, right? Um, so housework, and again, I, you know, this may be a uh, uh, review for many of you, but I think it's important to, to speak. So housework, it's invisible in two ways, right? So for one, it's literally invisible um, because it takes place inside the home. So no one sees it except for the people who are living there. Um, but for another, 
it's unpaid and so it's also invisible to the market um and because it's invisible to the market you know in other words it doesn't earn a person money it's also unvalued at least within the context of capitalist societies so another word for this type of invisible labor is reproductive labor um and this actually this word came about as a way of distinguishing it both from the productive labor of the marketplace and then what traditional accounts of labor tended to describe as the inverse unproductive labor meaning that these forms of labor didn't produce anything that could then be sold but thinking about housework and related tasks, just like childcare, as reproductive labor, um, it becomes very clear with this framework that this labor is, in fact, the very thing that allows the productive part of the economy to continue. Um, and not to constantly bring it back to COVID, because I think everyone at this point is very sick of COVID overdetermining every aspect of our life, but we have seen very ample evidence of the importance of reproductive labor in the past two years, right, as the pandemic sort of brought about this collapse of child care um, that would otherwise enable all of us, myself included, to do the research that I'm paid to do, right? Um, so my own research, uh, turning to that, is largely historical. Um, and for the past couple of years, I've been working on two major projects, uh, both of which use data, albeit in different ways, but to explore this question of labor, of the forms of labor that are easily made visible and easily captured by data, and the forms of labor that are not. Um, I'm going to focus on the, oh, I should say, uh, the first is actually, it's an interactive book on the history of data visualization. That's what you see on the left. Um, and the second is a series of more legibly sort of data scientific projects that make use of data and to some degree data visualization um, to directly engage questions of invisible labor and credit for that labor in the 19th century and more specifically in the anti-slavery movement of the 19th century United States. Um, and I'm actually going to talk about the second set of projects for this next uh, portion of the talk because I'm hoping that they'll be of interest to this particular audience. Um, but also because I think they complement Catherine's project in a really nice way. So if Catherine's project enters in at the phase of data collection, and like I said before, really has a lot to do with honoring the labor, both the physical labor, the tractable labor, and then also the emotional or invisible labor of this feminicide work. Um, the projects that I'm going to talk about has to do with methods of data analysis that can sort of retroactively exhume records of that labor from the past um, and think about ways that we can honor and better credit that type of work. Um, so just a bit more of historical context about the abolitionist movement in the United States. Um, this in many ways tracks the abolitionist movement in the UK with a couple of key distinctions. Um, and I would just say more broadly, and this should be sort of fairly obvious to anyone listening, it's not an understatement to say that it was one of the most important social movements in the Anglo-Western world, right? Um, because it led to the end of the abolition of slavery in Europe and in the United States. But one of the reasons why study about this movement has reawakened scholarly attention today is because of how that end to slavery was accomplished. And more specifically, it was accomplished through a multiracial coalition of men and women who coalesced around this common goal of ending slavery. But very crucially, they did not always agree about the means by which that goal should be accomplished. So, you know, do we burn it all down because we're talking about human freedom? Or is it possible to wait for gradual change? Um, do we move to the center so that we can increase the number of supporters who might be turned away from more radical positions? Or, you know, again, is there no room for moderation when we're talking about human liberty? And scholars and the public, I think, and I hopefully you listening, can start to see how some of these same questions about political change, about ends versus means, and about how you bring together coalitions of groups that don't always agree about the details of a particular social policy, um, or about how to achieve a particular policy, how you sort of wrangle these coalitions such that certain clear and desirable ends can be achieved. 
In any case, um, one of the specific questions that uh, we wanted to explore, as I mentioned just a minute ago, has to do with the labor involved of this work of social change. Um, and I was guided in this work by some of the qualitative research that I'd done in earlier parts of the project, which had surfaced editorials like this one. So this is written by Marianne Shad. Uh, she was a Black American Canadian woman. And here she is talking about the fact that even among women, she had to work harder than her white counterpart. She says here, we feel confident that few, if any, females have had to contend against the same obstacles that she had in the process of editing her, her anti-slavery newspaper and therefore advocating for a certain set of political beliefs. So the technical question became, could we develop some methods, um, and methods of text analysis in particular, to surface this outlay of work? And so uh, this particular part of the project I did in collaboration with Sandeep Soni, who was then a grad student at Georgia Tech, where I was also then working, um, and with Jacob Eisenstein, who was then at Georgia Tech and who is now at Google. And we developed a computational model that could track the changes in the meanings of words in these newspapers. We used this was on the basis of diachronic word embeddings. We can talk a little bit more about the technical details later if you feel like it. Um, and we also developed a metric that could determine which newspaper was responsible for introducing each new or changed meaning of the word, and then which newspapers would be the next to pick it up. Um, and so when you bring together this model for identifying the word changes and then the metric for assessing which newspapers tracked others, you could explore how certain key political concepts like freedom or like justice, how they evolved as they moved from the margin, from these more radical newspapers, to mainstream newspapers, so these broader newspapers that tried to bring together multiple beliefs. Um, and even more important in terms of the labor involved in this work of change, we could see who was responsible for these words evolution. Um, in other words, you know, which newspaper editors were writing and printing articles that made use of or advocated for these new ideological concepts. So as part of this project, one of the things that we were able to do is aggregate these word changes by newspapers so we could identify broader patterns. And when we did this, we found some results that confirmed existing qualitative research on the subject, which was great, um, you know, proof that this, this method held weight, but we also found some unexpected findings. Um, so one thing that we found that was really affirming was how that newspaper editor that I was just talking about, Marianne Shad, seems to have innovated in new word meanings in far greater proportion to the meanings that she adopted from other newspapers. Um, so just to sort of take this out of the, the details of this work, in addition to her ideological claims that she was trying to do something more radical than her fellow newspaper editors, evidently she was also innovating at the level of discourse. So she was really influencing the way that other newspapers spoke about these topics under debate. But then one of the unexpected things that we found um, was the role of the Lily, this is this uh, white women's, suff uh, women's suffrage newspaper, um, which we included in our data set initially just as sort of a, a comparison to compare these newspapers that were centrally concerned with questions of abolition to papers that were covering topics that sort of ran alongside and at times crossed over into debates about abolition and ending slavery. Um, and the interesting thing to know about the women's suffrage movement in the United States, and I know less actually about the suff women's suffrage movement movement in the UK, um, and I'd be eager, honestly, to hear for feedback from those of you who do. Um, but in the US, at least, many of the white women contributors to this newspaper, you could think of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, quite famous, um, made actually explicitly anti-Black racist claims. So what does it mean in our analysis to find that this newspaper, The Lily, is you know up there innovating in language and influencing the abolitionist movement even as they maintained these anti-Black racist views. So as I've been working through these results, um, and I'm working on you know, some other projects that attempt to explain them and place them in their broader context, I've also realized that there is something that we can take away that has to do with feminist data science more generally. Um, and this is something that I think we already knew to be true, but I think is important, serves as an important reminder, which is that these words, they don't always reflect the actual beliefs, let alone the actions of those that speak them. 
And the reality is that any social movement, whether towards a more feminist approach to data science or towards these movement, these social movements of the 19th century United States, they're, they're shaped by a real range of sources and not all of them are easily allied in their belief systems or honestly even centered on a common cause. Um, you know, in terms of the historical takeaways, it's very important to recognize this complexity for what it is, not to sort of sweep away the anti-blackness of certain parts of the movement under the rug. Um, but I think on an even higher level, it shows how a feminist approach to data science doesn't end with the output of any particular model or any formal experiment. We have to continue to question the results of any particular data-driven analysis, um, asking what we can learn from the data, and then what we can't or at times can never learn from the data alone. So again, we just need to be constantly placing our results in their social, cultural, and historical contexts by both or either uh, quantitative or qualitative means. And I think we also need to continue to interrogate our own ro roles as re researchers um, and as scholars, especially those of us who are white, who are cisgender, um, who w want to be doing this anti-racist feminist work. Um, Okay, I actually, I'm going to pivot here. I don't have a great transition here, except to say that um, the, the past examples have focused on the issue of power and people, um, of sort of like the people who have power and then the people who don't. But another major idea that comes from feminism relates to more conceptual structures of power um, and more specifically binary structures that are defined by a hard distinction between two groups. Um, so feminist theory has helped to show how these binary distinctions are usually hiding a hierarchy with one group on top and the other on the bottom. And once you see the hierarchy, you start to understand how that hard line between the groups um, is there to ensure, uh, why it's there in the first place, which is to ensure that one group is able to stay on the top and the other group isn't able to sort of creep up in. Um, the distinction, obviously, between the idea of man and the idea of women is the obvious reference point, since it's a clear example, both of a false binary um, and an unequal hierarchy, right? There are more than two genders, and among them, no gender is intrinsically better than any of the others. But one of the key moves of feminist theorists is to take this critique of the gender binary and use it to question other binaries and hierarchies that we encounter in the world, like the distinction between nature and culture, um, between teacher and student, or uh, the one that this next, and this is actually my final example, takes up, which is this artificial distinction between reason and emotion. So uh, in an Anglo-Western context, we've been taught that reason is somehow better than emotion. Uh, and we see this play out in data and in data visualiz visualization in particular. And this is what I'm gonna talk about for the next set of examples. Um, so best practices for data visualization often involve a clean design, a minimalist aesthetic, um, presenting just the facts. But you know, why are these our best practices? Especially when research has shown that we interpret these aesthetic choices just as emotionally. So we tend to believe that these types of charts are more truthful than they actually are. So you could think of research by Jessica Holman that has shown that just including a source line for a data visualization makes a person, a viewer, trust it more. It doesn't matter whether the credit line actually describes whether a source that exists or not. Uh, but I want to think about the opposite for a minute. So visualizations that understand the rhetorical force that they own um, and deliberately leverage it. Um, and this is the, what the nest example uh, helps you and us explore. Uh, so what you're looking at here are screenshots of an animated visualization. This is by the design firm Periscopic. Um, it's of the number of gun-related deaths in the United States in a particular calendar year. You're looking here at 2018. Um, each of the people killed by a gun in that year is represented as a single arc. Um, the arcs, they're traced one by one onto the screen. They, they start out really slow so that you can read the information about the particular victim. Um, but then they get faster and faster until they create this sort of semicircular web um, that you see in the larger image. It's really, it's overwhelming to watch, honestly. It's actually almost unbearable, but that's kind of the point. Um, it goes on for too long because there are too many people being killed by guns. Um, too many deaths are plotted on the same visualization because too many people are being killed, right? So this is yet another epidemic. 
So methodologically, it's no less statistically sound than any other study. Um, the data about the people derived from a, a crime data set released by the federal government. Um, the projected lifespans are determined using a global model released by the World Health Organization. But it was viewed with intense suspicion from the visualization community because it made us feel things. And a feminist approach here would say, that's not a problem at all that it made us feel things. And actually, it's a more compelling visualization precisely because it blends reason with emotion. So rebalancing emotion and reason, it opens up the data communication toolbox and allows us to focus on what really matters in a design process. So honoring context, listening to experience, and using your work to take action to challenge these imbalances of power that we encounter in the world. So I just wanna close with an example of a digital project that takes so much of what I've said here today to heart. Um, this is Homegoing. This is a recent project by COVID Black. Um, this is directed by Kim Gallen at Johns Hopkins. And with this project, a Gallen and her team have created a digital memorial to the Black Americans who have died of COVID. As you can see from the screenshot at left, the themes of this project are data and honor. What the team did first was simply gather the names of people who had died. But rather than visualize them merely as data points, they painstakingly tracked down photos and obituaries for each of the people named in the data set. So in this website, if you click on one of the small names or small photos, it brings up a larger photo accompanied by a short biography of the person who died with a link to the news source that it came from. This project refuses to let these people be anonymized as data points and insists that we recognize the individual life that each data point represents. And in this way, it challenges power as well. So the idea of homegoing, as Gallen explains on the site, is a way of celebrating and paying respect to the Black people in death in a way that is not often given them in life. And at a time, and this remains true when Black Americans are being killed by COVID at a, at a rate of at least twice that of white Americans, this memorial also serves as witness and then as testimony to that fact. So this brings me really to the last, last, last final point I wanna make before the Q&A, which is probably obvious from these examples, um, but it's that data feminism insists on an expanded definition of data, of data work, and of data science. So our data science is not defined by the size of the data set, by the formal credentials of the people undertaking the work, um, because the, these concerns are continually used to exclude women and people of color from the fields, as well as to exclude work that makes a contribution that is socio-technical or humanistic rather than purely technical. But if we expand our definition of data science, then we can clearly see that some of the most exciting work today is being undertaken by artists, by journalists, by humanists, by community organizers, by activists. And sure, you know, some of this work does look like traditional data science, um, but it can also look like an interactive sculpture, a fun and engaging website, or even a data mural, which is what you see on the bottom of the screen. And in the book, we have hundreds of examples of all sorts of projects like these, which we selected to illustrate our points and really inspire folks to action. Because one of the things that Catherine and I really believe and sort of hold true and have really throughout this whole process is that while we recognize that data is at the root of so many problems today, it can also contribute to possible solutions. So uh, that's all I've got for my remarks today. Thank you for uh, staying with me through this real uh, range of projects that I shared with you today. If you wanna get in touch with me uh, in the future, there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. Internet, Twitter, Instagram, GitHub, uh, all of those things you can see on the screen. I think I will stop sharing my slides now so that I can see all of y'all, as they say in the South here. Um, and uh, Erica, uh, well, that's fantastic. What do you think? Thank you so much. That's really inspiring and challenging as well, I think, and very stimulating. So thanks from, from us and from all the audience. Now, 
I can see questions coming in already. So let me just say to the audience that you, uh, you're welcome to switch your camera on if you'd like to. Um, you can uh, put your question in the chat window, please, and I'll take them from there. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question on, uh, you know, verbally as well, then you can just uh, raise your hand. You should be able to do that by clicking the options at the bottom of your screen. So please do that and I'll take a range of questions and comments from each. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. Um, we have a question from Tanushree Rao, who asks um, how you balance the principle of focusing on marginalized groups, um, on covering invisible labor, et cetera, with the labor involved for participants in the research process. So for example, there might be some communities that are over-researched and have are taking on that burden of doing work as interviewees. And how can we prevent unfairly burdening um, those groups? That's a really good question. And I think in many ways is one of the first questions that needs to be answered before any of this work takes place. Um, so the first thing to do is recognize that that is an issue, that that really happens, that in this push, and I would say this, it, it seems to me like a global push to follow through on the recognition that these types of projects need, do need to involve the communities that they are seeking to um, aid and assist and impact. These need to be projects that are more mutually constituted um, and that are coming up through a more equitable uh, design process. But that does mean that groups that are small in numbers or sort of over identified as being value, valuable contributors are overburdened at this point. And we see this everywhere, you know, not just at the community level, but even within academia, right? When scholars who represent certain groups are being now called in to uh, contribute to research projects, to serve on committees, to serve on panels, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say two things to this, and this is not an exhaustive list, but to me, the most important things, um, one, uh, pay people for their time. Um, and pay them not just token amounts, but amounts commensurate with the expertise that they provide. This often involves when you are writing grants for this type of research, when you are pitching seed grant type things, having significant line, line items for participant research and also often not labeling it as, you know, participant research or community feedback or things like this, but really elevating the role that these members of communities play to the level of true collaborators. Um, and then the second, which is more com uh, uh, conceptual, but I think is equally important, um, which is to make this research worth these folks' time, right? You know, if you come in with a project that was preconceived, that is from the outside, and you're like, I just want to do this, and I just need you to sign off on it, that is not a desirable research opportunity for folks who are already receiving lots of different requests from different venues. Um, but if you begin the design process, and this is hard for academics, right? You know, we were just talking before the, um, the panel started just about how a lot of these feminist approaches take more time, especially at the outset, before you sort of, uh, before you initiate, or as you're beginning to initiate and formulate your research process, really making sure that you have the appropriate team in place. They're even asking the right questions. And this goes against the external pressures that a lot of us face as researchers to produce, 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 right? And yet, if you do take more time in the beginning to formulate appropriate research questions that are meaningful and impactful and desired from these community members, um, then it can be a more worthy project for all people involved. And just a plug um, for how you do this practically, uh, Sasha Costanza Chalk has written a book called Design Justice. And uh, Sasha does a lot of work in her teaching with local community groups and has a really good chapter in that book about how to align the sort of timelines of classroom and project based research with the realities of nonprofit time, community time, um, just the realities that these timelines are not the same. And so I would that's also open access. I would direct people there if you're looking for a really practical suggestion about how to scope projects and structure collaborations in meaningful ways. Fantastic, thank you. Some really practical points there. Um, so another um, question from Juan Vivanco, um, how, how do you approach the counter argument of data quality? I'm sure that you get this a lot, um, you know, saying that uh, collecting data in these kinds of ways may be less reliable because it relies on unverified accounts. Um, how do you approach that? that sort of argument and respond to it that, uh, you know, that things coming in may be biased in some way. Yeah, I mean, so this is a really good point. And in 
in our book and in other versions of this presentation, I have a really good example of how what you would assume to be that sort of more formally systematically collected data is more accurate and more thorough and less lacking in certain certain key gaps. That assumption is not universally true. And it is very often the opposite case that data that is collected from the grassroots level in cooperation with community groups does give you a more accurate um, and more contextualized account of what's really happening on the ground. And so my response to that, again, is not a universal, right? Literally every data collection process is different, but really to push back against and honestly refuse this belief that formal research design and survey design undertaken by scholars is always better um, than a community or grassroots effort. And I think honestly, you know, research, we know this as well, right? You know, any data, no data set is, entails all of the experience of the phenomenon that you're trying to capture. Um, in certain ways, we know this, you know, we know what the gaps may be and in other ways we do not. Um, but I think really just to be, you know, again, refuse the binary, refuse the hierarchy, do not put one above the other, but to say, look, we can learn different things um, from these different processes. And if we want to learn more, we need both of these together. I mean, that's the real, that's honestly like sort of the fundamental theoretical feminist move, which is to say it's neither either or, um, bring things together and see what we can learn by placing these in dialogue with each other. Fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so another question then from Sheila Kibuki, who asks, um, how does data feminism interact with current efforts to integrate indigenous knowledge methods? I, lo I love that question. It's such a good one. Um, I mean, I would say that uh, this book and feminist practices have a lot to learn from indigenous methods of data collection, of cultural heritage stewardship, and just sort of indigenous approaches to knowledge formation more generally. Um, questions of indigeneity within indigenous approaches to data collection are really important because I think they help to um, amp up the stakes for questions of privacy and ownership and what it means to uh, collect data on a subject that you are not yourself personally personally connected to. Um, and so one of the, the I was, was going to say issues, but it's not a problem. It's like a, a, a topic um, that research involving indigenous data collection needs to contend with is the fact that for so long, due to global colonial projects, there has been this extractive relationship between the researchers who come in from outside and extract colonial knowledge and then take it away and use it for their gain, um, oftentimes to uh, a range of devastating consequences to the groups that offered up their data. And this goes alongside the ways in which indigenous knowledges, and this is not universal, I don't mean to sort of homogenize all indigenous groups here, but in many cases, the ways in which knowledge transfer takes place within indigenous communities is over time and through uh, cultivated respect and honor, right? Like you do not, there is, there is, it should not be that you get to learn everything immediately, right? You have not earned that knowledge. And again, this runs up or sort of uh, is goes against the ways in which Western approaches to knowledge, not just extraction, but production are fast, immediate, and don't really make distinctions between the knowledge and who gets to possess it, right? And so I think that these questions, which are real questions and have human impact for the relationships between sort of settler colonial data projects can be used as broader lenses for thinking more generally about what it means to take data from groups, to use that data, and then what you do with the information or knowledge that is gained. Um, gained from elsewhere. And I would direct if you, um, there's a couple of groups right now that are really, that are generously, I would say, making public a lot of indigenous data practices that have been held in community prior to, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, there, I believe there's the Indigenous Data Network that is doing some of this. Um, there's the Indigenous Protocols Group. Um, those both have sort of white papers and vision statements um, about methods more generally. And then I was just pointed to a really interesting um, database of indigenous film that uses a practice called tribal sourcing, which has to do with authenticating and validating certain universally viewable records through um, indigenous people and indigenous knowledges. So that's through Arizona State, some pointers to some interesting projects. Thanks, that's great. So some, some good resources to follow up there. Thank you. 
Um, so a question from uh, Rachel Spicer talking about the UK Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which has recently released a roadmap to an effective AI artificial intelligence assurance ecosystem. And she asks, how could data feminism best guide and be integrated into such an ecosystem? I guess that's quite a big question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, my answer, I, it's a big question, but I kind of have a small, uh, short and maybe glib answer, but like very easily, you know, the practices that we outline in the book are specific and actionable ways to act on a broader desire for ethical data systems, right? Um, they draw from feminist approaches and they are one way to approach this kind of work. It's not the only way. Um, but like I said, at the very beginning of our talk, you know, when Catherine and I, having worked in this space for a long time, saw people sort of throw up their hands and say, what do we do? We know we, we, we want to do data for social good. You know, we want to make change. How do we do it? You know, we said, well, like there's very clear models here that ha have been ongoing and enduring and we can learn from those. And so I would just say, you know, take a look at these principles and think about how you might map them to certain practices. And there have been examples I'd off the top of my head. I don't know them, but um, a couple of nonprofits have tried to incorporate our principles into their internal um, approaches to data collection and research, and it seems to have worked for them. So that's great. So uh, so read the book. Great. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as Lauren mentioned at the beginning, it's it's available for free online, but for those that are able, do buy a copy or recommend it to your university library to buy a copy because it's such a good resource for everybody. Um, okay, thank you. If anybody has any further questions, please do put them in the chat. Maybe I'll throw in one of my own um, that we were talking um, before about, you know, you, you said that the... Um, the data feminism doesn't begin with the data and it doesn't end with the data. So maybe because this is an academic audience, I wondered if you have any reflections on the sort of academic practices going going beyond just sort of data collection and the use of data, but more more generally, what how can we be embodying data feminism a bit more in, in what we're doing as academics? Sure. I mean, there's so the intellectually, I feel like my answer, and it's one that I have always believed, but increasingly find this belief solidified, which is that working with data requires truly interdisciplinary collaborations. I do not think that it is possible to produce robust research that can have real world applications unless individuals and groups trained in multiple disciplines are brought to the table as equal collaborators. Too many times we see research design, the impact of a paper, um, you know, even broader impact statements being formulated without consulting folks who are trained up in fields that have spent a long time thinking about those particular things. Every once in a while, someone is brought in to like give feedback or, you know, what do you think? But true interdisciplinary scholarship is what is needed. And along with that comes with a mutual respect for all of these methods, right? And again, reject this binary that somehow the large is better than the small, the quantitative is better than the qualitative. Um, and not just say, but truly believe and work to accomplish collaborations that bring all of these perspectives together on an equal level. Um, and just sort of on a practical level, I've been thinking about this a lot in my own uh, project management and the way in which collaborations take place. I think in academia, um, and I'm speaking for every, for everyone, but I think it is usually the case, and this is the reason why we are academics, is that we sort of get captivated by an idea. You know, you meet someone and you think, oh, we have this great synergy, let's find a project and let's do it. And so you sort of take this little spark and you try to build on the initial momentum and sort of take it as far as you can go as quickly as you can. But oftentimes that leads to project teams that are not interdisciplinary, that are not inclusive, and maybe aren't even asking the best question um, that could be asked of that particular group. And so I, what I personally am trying to do is instead of following my impulse, which is I think part of the culture to just sort of seize the opportunity and move forward, you think, okay, here's this general idea. Who do I want on the project team? Let's have some more planning meetings and uh, project structuring meetings early on, um, and then figure out the appropriate research question or set of methods to employ as we pursue this work. 
Fantastic. So thank you, Lauren. We're coming to the end of our slot now. So I just want to say a huge thank you. Everybody in the chat has said thank you so much how interesting it's been and how we have you know, actionable things that we can go away and put into practice in our own research and our own work. So thank you so much for that really inspirational talk and discussion. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much again to the speaker, the host, and everybody who asked questions. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks and bye-bye.